communities. I think it's very helpful that these communities are interacting with each other. And we can also realize that there is really quite some difference in language. So sometimes we have to speak in simple words and I will try to do this here for our topic. What we are investigating might be not so relevant to the second community because we are not so much looking into interactions. We rather study the properties of single impurities. But you will see that these properties of the single impurities also come from interactions. So it's not such that you just put an atom on a surface and then you have a property of this atom, but it has to do with the interaction of the atom with the underlying substrate and the underlying um, 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 structures. So I will illustrate this with a few uh, examples. Um, I will look into cobalt atoms sitting on different sub substrates and the example that is really highlighting this the most is cobalt on graphene and we will see that um, if you grow graphene layers on top of metal surfaces and you put cobalt atoms on top, um, and you study the magnetic properties, it really depends what you have below the graphene. So it's if someone um, says that cobalt on graphene has this and this property, um, you, never sh you should never believe him because it's something that has to do with what is below, the, as you will see. And then we will uh, finally raise the question whether you can really make single atom magnets and what are the ingredients for, for doing this. So. Um, let me see if I can use this as a pointer. Do you have a pointer? Okay, it's a faint pointer. <laughs> okay, let's see. So um, the talk starts by an introduction into magnetic anisotropy. And of course, this is something that um, most of you in the audience, thank you, don't need. But I simply um, recall this because it's also important for the numbers. So one of the ingredients in if you want to make a stable magnet is really that you want to have a high magnetocrystalline anisotropy. And for this, I bring up this um, measurement that dates back um, almost 100 years here. And that's a measurement where people have measured the magnetization of cobalt bulk along certain crystallographic directions. And if you look here, if you magnetize cobalt um, along this 0001 direction, which is along the c-axis of this HCP lattice, then you can saturate it at rel relatively low external magnetic fields. And if you want to magnetize your sample along a difficult direction, which is in plane here, then you have a hard time. So you have to apply a magnetic field, which is here a one Tesla, to get it saturated in this difficult direction. And now if you know the magnetic moments, you can fit these magnetization curves and you can directly deduce the magnetocrystalline anisotropy energy. And this is normally given per unit volume, but we like to express it here um, as a number per atom because we are interested in the single atom properties. And here you have 45 microelectron volts. So if you look into the magnetocrystalline anisotropy energies that people are able to do in alloys, for example, that are used for magnetic recording, you can see that um, this um, cobalt, clean cobalt here um, has this um, 40 or 45 or 50 microelectron volts. And then you can go to alloys of iron platinum here, which are in the range of 1 milliEV per unit cell of this alloy. So that's the typical number that we can do in bulk materials. Now um, um, I will show you here a few magnetization curves and these magnetization curves are measured with different techniques. So one way to measure magnetization curves of individual atoms is to look into XMCD. And um, these are ensemble measurements. So you have ensembles of atoms that are sitting at a surface. And if you look into these magnetization curves, they look very much the, um, the same as the curves that we have seen before for bulk cobalt. So you have a certain direction where you can easily saturate your sample. And then you have another direction where you have a hard time to saturate your sample. So that's really the intrinsic way how to measure magnetocrystalline anisotropy energies. <coughs> so here you have the example where um, C axis is easy to saturate. And here we have the example for single cobalt atoms sitting on a platinum 111 surface, where the out of plane direction of the platinum 111 surface is easy to saturate. And this one is really very hard. So you can see the difference between these two curves has to do with magnetocrystalline anisotropy. And if you fit these two magnetization curves with this um, straightforward formula, you get that the magnetocrystalline anisotropy is 9 milliEV. So this is something that should surprise you because clean cobalt bulk has 45 <coughs> microelectron volts. 
So we have a system here where we have um, a low coordinated um, cobalt atom that has 200 times more magnetocrystalline anisotropy than bulk cobalt. And this has something to do with the fact that you have here an orbital moment of one mi bores. And also this is um, a little bit surprising because in, bulk, in, in the gas phase, cobalt has an orbital moment of three mi bores. But if you make a solid out of cobalt due to the localization effect and crystal field effects, this orbital moment is almost entirely quenched. So normally in bulk, you have only 0 0.1, 0 0.2 mi bores. So now people often don't believe that we really have ensembles of single atoms and therefore I have to show this slide to you. So here you have a platinum 111 surface and if it, if, it, if it is well prepared you have basically only these platinum atoms but of course you have some carbon impurities here for example. These are carbon atoms that are sitting subsurface so you can see in the SDM image that there are the three platinum atoms which are close to these subsurface carbon atoms which appear dim. So you have um, eight per mil of a monolayer impurities here. And now if you put down, um, let's say, five per mil of a monolayer, one monolayer refers to the atomic density of your, of your substrate. If you, op if you put down 0 0.005 monolayers of cobalt, then you can see in this SDM image that you really get only one species. There's only one apparent height. And you can see also that um, these atoms are relatively far apart, but of course they fall onto random sites, so you get a random distribution, spatial distribution. And of course you can calculate um, really what the mean size is, so the expected mean size is 1.01, .01. so you get 1% of dimers roughly or so, or even a little bit less than this. So these are the kinds of ensembles that we are looking into. So we have no spatial resolution, we prepare this sample at the synchrotron where we can do this XMCD measurement. And the advantage of doing the XMCD is that you not only get the um, magnetization curves as, as I showed you, but you get also further information. You get, for example, a spin moment, orbital moment. And in order to illustrate this, I simply show you briefly these dipole selection rules here, um, the sum rules that you get for XMCD. So here you see the X-ray abs absorption, the total absorption spectrum for the L3 edge, L2 edge of the um, cobalt here in that case. And then you can measure this with polarization. So this is for left-hand polarized um, photons and this is for right-hand polarized photons. And then you can s make the difference between the two and this is the so-called XMCD spectrum or XMCD signal. And then you can associate here areas under these peaks and you can also associate areas under the total absorption peaks. And if you do this, um, then you can calculate what the orbital moment is, for example and you need the number of holes in the D shells, and then you have this area plus this area divided by the total area of the absorption. So it's re a relatively simple thing to record XMCD data here, get these areas, and then you calculate this. And if you have a theoretician that can calculate the number of D holes, for example, then you are set. Then you really have your orbital moment. If you want to be um, independent, then you divide these two equations and then you get a ratio between the orbital and, and the spin moment. And this is something that you get only from the areas. And then, of course, you can again ask, for example, a, a theoretical group to calculate the spin moment or try to measure the spin moment in some other way. As we, we have seen already, you can do it also with spin excitation spectroscopy with the SDM. And then you have a Hamiltonian where you get the spin moment. So once you know the spin moment and you have measured this ratio, you know the orbital moment. So the reason why we have observed this very high anisotropy energy is actually highlighted here if you look how it evolves as a function of the size of your clusters you are studying. So here we go up in size and you can see that the magnet magnet magnetocrystalline anisotropy goes down. And if you look at the same time how the orbital moment varies, you can see that the orbital moment goes down as well. So the orbital moment goes from 1.1 mi bores which is of course not three mi bores, which is the gas phase value, value, but still a significant fraction of the gas phase value. And it goes down to let's say 0.3 mi bores and the bulk value would be a little bit below 0.2 mi bores. So this is something which is referred to as orbital magnetism, which means that the orbital moment really plays an important role in giving this system the magnetocrystalline anisotropy. What also plays an important role is that um, platinum 111 
actually has an induced magnetization. So the um, cobalt atom which sits on top induces magnetization in the three neighbors and the uh, um, platinum has a strong spin orbit coupling and this really gives you this um, relatively high anisotropy. So if you look just into this number, then of course you can estimate how this would behave if the cobalt atom sitting on the surface would be a classical magnet that, that has to go over an activation barrier to go from, uh, the spin is one by the way of this cobalt atom, so if you have to go over this barrier here in the spin zero state and then go down here into this state, so you have the ground state as m equals plus one and minus one, if you would have to go over this barrier then you would have a lifetime of your magnetization of about one second at two Kelvin and it's absolutely no problem to do a measurement at two Kelvin. So in principle um, this should be a stable magnet. We have published this about um, 12 years ago, so um, this has really triggered an entire field, basically, this um, discovery that single atoms have quite interesting magnetic properties. And of course, the question was whether this is really a stable magnet. And as um, um, uh, Roland Wiesendanger has shown, actually, in his talk, you can measure these magnetization curves not only in an ensemble way, but um, in the meanwhile, you can really use spin polarized STM to address the magnetic properties also on an atom by atom way. And then you can measure, for example, what the moment is for different atoms here that you need to fit your magnetization curve. So you can really do something where you go from atom to atom, see what the environment is and so on. But let's concentrate on these two magnetization curves that are measured by spin polarized STM. One is at 4 Kelvin, the other one is 0.3 Kelvin. And you can see that both of these curves are actually perfectly behaving if you um, have a paramagnetic impurity. So it's a paramagnetic impurity and if you go to lower temperatures you just change the slope here of the susceptibility at zero field. That's all what happens but you don't have an opening at all. So this means that you have paramagnetic impurities and when this came out we thought actually um, it was maybe due to the fact that the tunneling voltage that is used to get the maximum spin contrast is much beyond this 9.3 milliEV. So of course the tunneling electrons um, can excite some magnetic transitions and we tried very hard in my own group to measure with <coughs> lower voltages but even if you measure with lower voltages there is no hysteresis so we believe that this is really a paramagnetic impurity that has a very high uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy but that has some other way to go across the barrier and there you can uh, think of different ways to do this. So now I want to switch a little bit the system and go into molecular magnets or what people call molecular magnets and for me the definition of a magnet is really something where you take away your field and you still have a um, remanence, a, a certain amount of remanence. This does not need to have the saturation magnetization but a certain amount of uh, remanence. And I want to point out that these endofullerenes are really the work of Thomas Graeber and um, uh, Westerström at the University of Zurich and we have contributed to do these XMCD measurements. So what I'm showing here is basically the work of um, of University of Zurich. So these endofullerenes are quite funny structures because you have here a C80 cage and inside this C80 cage you have magnetic atoms that are coupled to a nitrogen atom, so you have a central nitrogen atom and you have three magnetic atoms around. And it is very popular to use as magnetic atoms 4F elements and not 3D elements um, in these um, uh, endofullerenes. So what has been done here is, for example, to synthesize dysprosium N and scandium 3 minus N. So you have the possibility to have one dysprosium atom here and then you would have two scandium atoms and one nitrogen in the middle or you have two dysprosium, three dysprosium, no scandium at all. So you can have these three um, 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 molecules. And if you look what the magnetic moments can do, you can see here if you have um, this n equals to one, you have just one magnetic moment because the scandium has no magnetic moment. So there is no miracle. Um, this magnetic moment can point towards the nitrogen or can point away from the nitrogen. That's the two states that you can have. Now if you have two magnetic moments, for example here for this dysprosium 2, scandium 1, you can have these moments like this, aligned um, to the right or aligned to the left. This would be a ferromagnetic alignment in a way, but it's a non-collinear state. And then the excited state would be an antiferromagnetic alignment in this way or in this way. 
Now, if you want to change the magnetization from this situation to this situation, for example, you have two possibilities for this magnet. One is that both spins have to tunnel simultaneously, and the other one is ha that you excite here to this um, higher lying state, and then you can um, de excite to the other state. So, from this, you can already see by principle this must be a very stable magnet because it's very difficult for both magnetic moments to tunnel at the same time and it's also costing some energy to go to this excited state and then go via this excited state and reverse the magnetization. And then you have this person here that has a um, very complicated situation where you have three spins and of course there you have frustration and you have um, um, these uh, ground states here and the first excited state is here. Now if you look into the magnetization curves you can um, see that this um, species with one dysprosium um, decays by tunneling, but you still have a little bit of an opening here. And then the species with two dysprosium atoms has a very um, pronounced hysteresis curve. And the species with uh, frustration um, shows an almost paramagnetic curve. So this is the starting point where we started to put these guys on the surface, because if you want to make something that has to do with Spintronics, you need electrodes and you want to have a current that goes through, so you have to st stabilize these molecules at surfaces. So these are all powder measurements here. Now if you put them onto a surface, the first question you can ask yourself is whether this cage itself has an orientation at the surface, and this has been um, demonstrated by a photoelectron diffraction that this really has an orientation. And then you can ask yourself whether this part inside is also linked to the cage and has also an orientation with respect to the surface. So we have measured XMCD um, here on the M edge of this dysprosium atom in, in this species with two dysprosium. And you can see clearly that these absorption spectra, they have a um, very, very different, different signature as you vary the angle of the incident photons. So this is out of plane here and this is almost in plane. And you can see that these two peaks have the same amplitude and here you see a clearly a difference and amplitude of these two peaks. So now you can do multiplet calculations with a certain electronic state. One has to say that this is in a three plus state. So um, these dysprosium atoms have lost three electrons in this molecule and this means that the two S electrons are gone and also one electron from the D shell is gone and it stays in the 4F10 configuration that you have here. So you can see that one electron from the D shell is gone and the two S electrons are also gone. So now if you do multiplet calculations here, you can see clearly that um, for one direction with respect to the plane, which is defined by dysprosium nitrogen here, you can reproduce this spectrum and for the other direction you can reproduce this spectrum. And this directly gives you that um, the, uh, uh, the cage um, must be oriented and the interior of the cage must be oriented on, on the surface. That's quite nice. So you have really... Um, um, uh, a magnetic molecule that is sitting on a surface which is not a yet a molecular magnet. It becomes a molecular <laughs> magnet if you look into this slide here, be because as soon as you can demonstrate that you have a hysteresis, it's a molecular magnet. And these are the measurements that we have taken in our XMCD um, end station at the Swiss light source. So you go down from high magnetic fields to low magnetic fields, and you can clearly see that you have here a remnant magnetization. Then we have um, um, magnet where it takes some time to change polarity. So um, we are now changing this power supply, but in, in the moment we still have it. So you have to take some time to change polarity. So in this time the magnetization decays and then you can go on. So it's not such a nice magnetization <laughs> curve, but you can clearly see that you have a hysteresis there and you have also remnant magnetization. Then you go back and again you have this change of polarization. And you can also derive from these magnetization curves um, T1, so magnetization relaxation times, and these are 120 seconds here for multi-layers. And now if you go into the sub layer regime where you have just a single um, layer of molecules sitting at the surface or even below, you still see this um, remnant magnetization. And this, what is important is always how much remnants you have with respect to the saturation. So it keeps about, let's say, 20% of its saturation here at remnants and the time for relaxation is 30 seconds. So that's clearly a molecular magnet and it even outperforms some of the molecular magnets that are actually quite fashionable. 
The advantage is also that you have this carbon 80 cage around, so it's something that Thomas Greber refers to as a spin shuttle because it's really protected. So this carbon 80 around protects chemically um, the part which is inside. Now let's just look into a second molecular magnet, and this is um, phthalo cyanine double decker, and um, you can do in between these two molecules here, you can put whatever 4F element you want. So we were interested in terbium. And this is something that has been done in my group. Um, this work actually uh, goes back to a Japanese group from Ishikawa. And if you look into this measurement from Ishikawa, he was doing first um, AC susceptibility measurements. And these are measurements that show a peak if you look into the Chi um, 2. And this peak gives you basically something like a blocking temperature of your magnet. And um, he has found that this temperature is 40 Kelvin, and that's really much higher than th what has been seen before in other single molecule magnets. One has to say this has been in 2003, so that's some time back. But there, all other single molecular magnets had a blocking temperature of 7 Kelvin. So then um, it became really a molecule that people became very much interested in. And um, he has measured also with um, DC susceptibility measurements and NMR the splitting of the levels. And if you look into the splitting of the levels and in, into the ground states, you can see here, um, if you put a terbium atom here as a lanthanide, you get the ground state here, which is a plus minus 6. Jz is plus minus 6. And then if you want to go to the Jz plus minus 5, you have to move up 440 centimeters to the minus 1, which is maybe not a unit that you like so much, but it's um, roughly 55 milliEV. And um, so you can see if you want to pick one of them, and you want to make a stable magnet, pick this one because the first excited state is quite high up. So you have a ground state which, which is J um, equals 6, and uh, the probability that you find hysteresis is quite high. And if you look here, it's hysteresis, but it's not such a nice hysteresis. And the people are, that are working in single molecular magnets, they are very excited about this type of hysteresis. But um, you can see here clearly that you have a huge opening here. But if you look at the relevant fields, at the uh, zero field, for example, how much remanence you have, it's only one-tenth of the saturation. So this molecule keeps one-tenth of its saturation magnetization. And um, this is something that has been nicely shown here in a diluted sample, because people often say, if you work in powder samples, that they are simply interacting these molecules. And then you have an ensemble measurement where you measure basically remanence due to this interaction. But if you can show that it does not depend on concentration, so here you have a very dilute sample. But if you go to um, higher concentration, even there, um, these measurements would not change very much. So it's really a single molecule property. Now we have been looking into this at a surface, and we are now um, working a lot with MGO because this is um, something that really nicely decouples any species from a metallic substrate. So our imagination of a um, device would be something where you have a metal substrate, some decoupling layer, and we favor MGO in the moment, and then you would have some species here that has a stable magnetization. And if you look um, how, it, um, how it grows, so this is a layer of two monolayers, MGO here on silver. And then if you look, look into this um, um, PC2 terbium, you can see that it makes very nicely ordered islands and you can even resolve the internal structure. You can even also see that you have the um, rotation of this lower lying PC and the upper lying PC as um, expected. Now what is really fascinating there is that you might remember how the powder samples look like. So the powder samples barely have an opening here. And now you look into a sample where normally the people that come from molecular magnetism, they have a hard time to stabilize their properties at surfaces. And here the properties get better at surfaces. So here you have a, an example where you put a molecular magnet onto a surface. And you can see that you have here a remanence, which is roughly 30% to 40% of the saturation. And you have um, um, a coercitive field, which is almost one tesla that you need to switch your magnetization. And you can see here that you can go even up to three tesla and you still have this opening. So that's quite interesting. If you compare it with um, these molecules sitting on silver directly, it doesn't look so nice. And if you 
do multilayers, you reproduce something that has been done before in powder samples, but the powder samples don't have the molecules oriented, they are all in different directions. And if you put multilayers on a surface, you orient them all, and then you measure also um, uh, superior properties. So on my computer it says 23 minutes, so... Uh, five minutes. That's okay. okay. Um, let me see what I will show you. So one important thing is also how you disturb your system by the measurement. So often this is something that is neglected and one has to take this into consideration with STM and also with other techniques. And here I show it with XMCD. So um, here you see relaxation times of the magnetization. So we first saturate our sample at 4, four Tesla. Then we go to 0.5 Tesla or 0 Tesla. And then we just see how the magnetization decays. And what you can see there is a noisy curve where it decays very slowly, and then you see these less noisy curves where it decays much faster. And this means if we use a higher flux, we can measure with a better signal to noise, but we really make the magnetization decay by our measurement. So in principle, you can see that you have different decay times. You can plot these decay, de decay times, and you have to plot them one over the de de decay time, and then you have one intrinsic part and one which is by photon induced, and from this you can deduce the intrinsic lifetime. Okay, so let me see. Um, maybe I show this part cobalt on graphene, just that you have a take home message that graphene is not graphene. <laughs> <laughs> so we have done here graphene on platinum, graphene on iridium, graphene on ruthenium. And um, the magnetic properties of the same species at the same adsorption site every time on graphene is quite different. First um, system has been studied by STM and there we look into the spin excitation and we see here this excitation at 8 mEV. And you can derive what the magnetocrystalline anisotropy is and what the spin is. The spin is 1 and you get a G value of 2.2. So you have a total moment of 2.2 mEBORs. And um, this anisotropy is quite high, so we have been talking about 9.3 mEV before, and now we see here 8 mEV, so it's quite high, but it's in plane, so it wants to be in plane. So cobalt on graphene is in plane. It's uh, always in the center of the hexagonal. It's always sitting on the six-fold side. So then you can simply s stop your measurements and say that cobalt on graphene is in plane, sits on the six-fold side, and so on. But if you look cobalt on graphene on ruthenium, then you can see here directly in looking into this XMCD signal at the different angles, um, this is the angle uh, normal incidence and this is the angle um, grazing incidence. And you can see, apart from the mistakes that I made in the transpar transparency, that you have here um, a larger signal out of plane than in plane. So this means that this is an easy access out of plane. So <laughs> graphene on ruthenium is out of plane and you can take a full magnetization curve and you can see out of plane, um, it's easier to saturate. Now you go to graphene on iridium, and there you can see that um, you have out of plane a little bit smaller signal than in plane, so it, it's something that wants to be again in plane. So the thing that I would like to um, finish with here is um, that cobalt on graphene has quite different properties, and depending on which surface you grow the graphene, um, apparently the electron electron correlations are different and the electron-electron correlations are really what makes the magnetic properties in this system. This you can see also from DFT calculations, depending on the U parameter that they use, they get quite different magnetic properties of these um, magnetic species. And you can see here, this is a very strong anisotropy in plane for a weakly bound graphene layer. And here again, it's also weakly bound because it has a mean distance here of three angstroms and it's also in plane, and once it's uh, more strongly bound, um, it wants to be out of plane. Okay, thanks a lot for this, uh, for your attention. <laughs>